excellent session this afternoon. My name's Gail Ganane and I'm on the ESEQA board member and I'm not an early childhood educator, I'm the number cruncher. <coughs> I'm the person that says, great idea, but where's the money? <coughs> but I think one of the really interesting things is where's the money is not necessarily a question for excellence because it's not the key to excellence. There's a whole stack of other factors in there. Money may help, but when you see some of our presenters this afternoon, you'll realise it's not the key. As Rachel Hunter, our chair, said in her opening address today, we have lots of stories to exchange. Stories about lifting the quality of education and care and the commitment to continuous improvements are the focus of this section. You'll hear from ASEQA's excellent rating specialists. Whether excellence is in your reach now or part of your long-term planning, I'm sure you'll leave this session with a much better understanding of the different ways in which excellence can be demonstrated. So, without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the stage or to introduce you to the facilitators for the session, Jennifer Riborovsky and Rhonda Livingston. Both Jennifer and Rhonda are senior advisors for excellence at ASEQA. They'll be joined later by Chris Mason, senior manager of operations, and Megan Alston, manager of operations at ASEQA. It's really exciting also to have representatives from our newly announced excellent rated services here today. This is just an absolute bonus because when this conference was being planned, we had no idea whether we would have any services that had been rated to that standard. The awarding of the first excellent rating is a really exciting milestone in our NQF story and we're thrilled to be joined later in the session by Penny Sweeney from Swallowcliff Preschool, Sue Shepherd from Wandana School-based preschool, Judy Hunt from Allenby Gardens Child Parents Centre, Tricia Dean from Karana Early Education Centre, Linda Matthews from the South Australian Department for Education and Child Development, and Sharon Neen from SK Kids Queensland. It's a delight to have them, and they're all sitting in the front row. And can I just suggest we all congratulate them? This is a great start. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you all to this session and I'll now hand over to you, Jennifer. Hi everybody and welcome. Um, thanks Gail for your introduction. I'm Rhonda Livingston and you've met my colleagues Jennifer, Chris and Megan down the front. Now, it's a hard gig being at the end of the day and um, I know that you've probably all come from afternoon tea, so you've had a chance to stretch your legs. But we thought that we would give you an opportunity to express your creativity. Um, and on your seats, you'll find a pipe cleaner. <laughs> so can I just check that everyone's got a pipe cleaner? Fantastic. So this is your opportunity to express your creativity and maybe even move around a little bit. So to start with, we'd like you just to take a minute to think about your knowledge of the um, excellent rating, your knowledge of the, um, the criteria for applying for an excellent rating, your knowledge of the guidelines and your knowledge of the process um, for applying for an excellent rating. So we're going to ask you just to have a minute, take a minute to think about that. And then we're going to ask you to rate your, your knowledge, your skill um, and your understanding of those three things. We're going to ask you to rate it between one, which is no or limited knowledge and understanding, to five, which is comprehensive knowledge and understanding. So we, you do get an opportunity to um, express, express your creativity and shape the pipe cleaners into, um, into a number, such as this one, which I have prepared earlier. That's an, a number five. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, a numero cinque, five. A number four. Number three, so you get the idea, but you do have the opportunity to express your creativity. Um, ours aren't very creative, but I'm imagining that, um, that you'll um, come up with some very creative numbers between one and five. Now remembering one is um, no or limited knowledge, 
And if you're not feeling very creative, please don't just choose number one because it's the easiest one to... <laughs> number five is, um, is you have a, a comprehensive understanding of the criteria, the guidelines and the process for applying for excellent, an excellent rating. So can you just take a minute to think about your knowledge and shape your pipe cleaner? How are you going? Are you ready to share? Everybody had an opportunity to um, shape their pipe cleaner? Fantastic. Now, can I ask you just to stand up, please? Everybody, if we can stand up. Thank you. Okay, if you've shaped your pipe cleaner into the number five, can you hold it up? Ah, fantastic. Well done. We've got a five. Great. Can I ask you to sit down if you've got a five? Who's got a four? Yay. Congratulations. Some beautiful fours. Very creative. Can I ask the fours that could, could you please take a seat? How about the threes? Oh, lots and lots of threes. That's great. So people are kind of a middle road in terms of their knowledge and understanding of the criteria, the guidelines. Twos. Oh, we've got quite a lot of twos. Is that a you or a two? You two. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, twos, if you could take a seat. And the ones. Oh, we've got some very creative ones. Yay. Fantastic. Thank you, Ones. So that's really been helpful for us because that gives us a bit of an understanding of where you are in terms of your, your um, knowledge and understanding because this is a very new process to everyone. So it's a, it's a learning experience for us all. So thank you for that. Can I also just ask for a show of hands um, in terms of people who have come from services that have been assessed and rated and they've achieved a sign very significant achievement, an overall rating of exceeding. Can I ask you if you put, could you put your hand up? Oh, fantastic, that's great. Wow, yes, that is a significant achievement. And I think it is important not to lose sight of the fact that the benchmark has been raised and to, um, to achieve a rating of exceeding is a very significant achievement. Can I also ask you to put up your hand if you are from a service that hasn't yet had their assessment and rating but is expecting or hoping to, um, to achieve exceeding national quality standard in that process. Fantastic. Well done. <laughs> I might also just ask if I could, um, just to get a sense of the audience, if, um, if you could put your hand up if you're from an outside school hours or a vacation care program. Fantastic. Long day care? Yay. Um, kindergarten? Fantastic. Uh, preschool? And family day care? Great. We've got a good spread of um, service types. Thank you. So just in terms of our session, um, what we were hoping to do this afternoon is to explore some of the background um, to the development of the National Quality Standard and the five-tier rating system. We're also going to look at the underpinning legislative standards and requirements and then look at the, um, the purpose for the excellent rating. We'll also unpack the criteria for applying for an excellent rating and look at how it was developed. And then we're, we're hoping to take you through the process that a CEQA uses in, in, the, um, in the assessment of applications. 
So following this, we're hoping to build your confidence to write your own story of excellence. And to do this, first we'll look at the resources that are available to assist you. And as Gail mentioned, we've invited representatives of the four services that have been rated as excellent to, um, to share their stories and their journeys. So these services, service representatives and educators have gen generously agreed to outline for you the key areas that their, service, their services are outstanding or exceptional therefore achieving the excellent rating. And to finish the session, a panel of officers involved in the assessment and, and rating will be available to answer any questions that you might have. And we've also invited representatives of our excellent services to join us on the panel. So, the background to the development of the National Quality Standard and the five-tier rating system. I'm sure most of you will be very familiar with the, um, the National Quality Standard and the, um, the five-tier um, ratings, but a key consideration of the Council of Australian Governments way back in December 2009, um, part of their decision to introduce a rating scale for education and care services was the desire to promote transparency and accountability, but also to make um, information available to parents so that they could make informed choices about the quality of the education and care service for their children. Another important consideration was recognising quality practice and building incentives for services to continually improve practice. So as you're aware, the National Quality Standard, or the NQS, sets a national benchmark for early childhood education and care and outside school hours care services in, in Australia. Education and care services are assessed by the, the, um, the state and territory regulatory authorities and every service receives a, a rating for each of the seven quality areas and an over, overall rating. So once assessed, the regulatory authorities will award the service a rating from one of the four rating levels. So the first is significant improvement required. So a service that receives this rating, the, it's highly likely that the regulatory authority would be working very closely with the service to improve the quality. Because as you can see on the slide, um, significant improvement required is where potentially the health, safety or welfare of children is at risk. The next level is working towards the National Quality Standard or the NQS. And so the, the, um, the benchmark of the NQS in services rated as working towards may not be meeting the, um, the, the benchmark in one or more quality areas. Meeting the National Quality Standard, the service is meeting all of the standards and the elements that, under, that sit under the standards, but they may also be exceeding in some areas. Exceeding the National Quality Standard, that's when the service has been rated as, as exceeding in at least four quality areas. And at least two of those four have to be in the key areas of quality area one, educational program and practice, quality area five, relationships with children, quality area six, collaborative partnerships with families and communities, and quality area seven, leadership and management. So if you're in um, Colette's session earlier, um, these, these services are, um, these quality areas are the um, process areas and really focusing on the quality of the relationships in your service. So in addition to achieving exceeding in four out of the seven and two out of the key areas, they, the service also has to have achieved a rating of meeting the national quality standard for the other quality areas. And of course underpinning all of the um, all of the national quality standards are the regulatory standards, which also must be met. So once the assessment and rating has happened, and if a service achieves the exceeding national 
quality standard, then the service, if the overall rating is exceeding national quality standard, they can choose to apply to a CEQA to be rated as excellent. Under the um, Education and Care Services National Law Act 2010, a CEQA is responsible for awarding, on application, the highest rating level. So the highest rating level is the exceeding rating under the National Quality Framework. Sections 152 to 160 of the National Law detail the requirements relating to the conditions for applying, how to apply, how often an application can be made. And the, the legislation also details what the ASEQA board must do in terms of um, assessing against the published criteria, seeking and taking into account information that we receive from the regulatory authority, making, notifying and publishing a decision and revoking an excellent rating. The legislation also deals with what a CEQA may do in terms of reassessing an education and care service against the criteria, as well as the requirements for reapplying for an excellent rating. The process for um, for establishing the criteria, um, section 153 of the national law outlines that a CEQA may determine and publish criteria that must be met by an approved provider, approved, sorry, an approved education and care service in respect to the award of the highest rating level. So way back in December 2011, the draft criteria, criteria were published on the CEQA website for consultation, and that consultation period ran until the 2nd of March 2012. So consultation was invited with, um, with providers, with peak bodies, and with the wider community. 471 people completed the survey, and of those 471, 107 provided feedback on the draft criteria. So this included four large providers of education and care services, along with nine government bodies, nine peak bodies, and one um, education institution. The remainder came from individuals, smaller education and care services, and sector representatives. So as part of this consultation, the draft criteria was revised in response to that feedback and the public consultation, and a CEQA sought some further feedback from a targeted group of stakeholders. In the second um, round of consultations, a CEQA sought, amongst other things, um, stakeholders' views on the proposed statement of purpose. So lots of positive feedback was, um, was received and it was perceived that the criteria for um, rating services at excellent now had a clear purpose that differentiated the excellent rating from the mandatory rating levels. It was perceived to be more equitable for small providers and services in metropolitan and rural and remote areas. And it was also perceived to be more valid because there's accountability for recipients to continue to maintain that level of um, service delivery across the three-year period. It's important to remember that um, excellent is a distinct achievement and it will be assessed against the board approved criteria. A CEQA anticipates that services will display excellence in different ways and the assessment criteria have been designed to capture and promote that variety. The excellent rating is not only about recognising and celebrating highly accomplished practice, innovation, creativity 
and excellence in early childhood education and care. It's also about learning from, sharing with and inspiring others. It's also about adding to the discussion around quality education and care and engaging families and communities in that discussion as well to build a shared understanding and a valuing of not only education and care services, but also educators and people who work in those services. The ASEQA board has approved three criteria. The first relates to exceptional education and care. The second is around leadership. And the third focuses on continual improvement and um, forward planning. It's also about acknowledging that excellent practice occurs across sectors, including outside school hours care, vacation care, long day care, preschool, kindergarten and family day care. So let's unpack the criteria in a little more detail. As I mentioned, criteria um, one relates to um, exceptional education and care. And the guidelines for applicants require that the application nominate three excellent themes in criteria one. So to choose from those top points, three themes that, they, that the, the service is um, outstanding or exceptional in. So once these themes are identified, the application then needs to explain how each is supported and promoted through the services practice, and importantly, they need to demonstrate how those practices improve outcomes for participating children and families. Keeping our eye on the ball, um, the, the whole focus of the National Quality Framework is about outcomes for children and families, so it is important to make that link in terms of outcomes for children and their families. The guidelines also um, provide some examples which may assist in, in uh, developing a comprehensive understanding of the expectations, but it's really important to remember that they are only examples and we don't want those examples to limit your thinking. So for example, the theme um, collaborative partnerships with professional community or research organisations, um, I've pulled out some examples from the guidelines um, about that demonstrate how this might look at the excellent level. So some examples are working with other service or leadership agencies to significantly improve services for children and families. So once again, um, that focus on outcomes for children and families. Another is where a specific family or community need has been identified working with local schools to develop targeted programs that improve outcomes for children transitioning from the education and care service to the school, going beyond establishing and maintaining connections to cultivating reciprocal partnerships with, for example, um, peak organisations or training organisations or um, universities, Another example is actively participating in research that has contributed to knowledge about education and um, education and care. Some other examples relating to um, practice and environments that enhance children's learning and growth. In the guidelines they make reference to, for example, indoor and outdoor environments that are pioneering in design and promote children's understanding about their responsibility to care, to care for the natural environment and make use of, um, make sustainable practice habitual. Another example, surroundings that are thoughtfully planned and used in innovative ways to support rich and varied learning opportunities. Another example um, relates to educators' work with children demonstrating sophisticated pedagogy that recognises the specialised and unique needs of a particular age group. Another example relates to um, documentation. Sophisticated and exceptional docu pedagogical documentation is used to reflect on, to extend and to enrich children's learning. 
So it's important to remember that they are um, only examples, but I guess what the examples try to do is to um, explain that we are, what we are looking for in terms of the excellent rating is, is practice that is outstanding, um, exemplary. So I mentioned the second criteria relates to leadership. And being a leader means um, taking the initiative to develop and model improved practice. Leadership's about guiding, influencing and inspiring change through, um, for example, using influence to pr promote innovative practices or approaches, or it might be raising awareness of the benefits of high quality education and care and raising the profile of the sector within the community, or it might be working to um, further the aims of the National Quality Framework for improving quality across the education and care sector. So leadership can be influential whether it's bold and far-reaching or it's subtle and lo or local. And it's, there's also a recognition that leadership occurs in many ways and takes many different paths, from local networks to new technologies. I've learned some new words from the session this morning, so I'm, um, I'm fully sick now. <laughs> Actually, I'm feeling quite well, thank you. <laughs> so a service aspiring to the excellent rating can be a leader in its community and or it might be um, a leader in the wider education and care community. So what a CIGRA is really looking for when they're assessing against this criteria is that the application shows how the service takes the initiative to develop and model exceptional practice that improves outcomes for children and for families. And the service willingly shares insights, knowledge and information to inspire and educate others. So there is a, um, a difference between leadership and management in the quality area seven of the National Quality Standard. That, um, that area focuses heavily on leadership within the context of the service, the organisation, whereas the criteria for excellent um, focuses on leadership more broadly, for example, in the community or in the wider sector. On tomorrow's program, there's a breakout session entitled Leadership and the, um, and the National Quality Framework. And in this session, the concept of leadership and what this means in early childhood education and care services and what it means for educators will be further explored. So this session is going to be um, led by uh, members of the Professional Support Coordinators Alliance and it should be very relevant and helpful in recognising and also um, striving to achieve excellence in, um, in leadership. The third criteria, as I mentioned before, is about continuous improvement and um, forward planning. So this part of the application seeks to ensure that the service will continue to demonstrate excellent practice and leadership throughout the three-year period of the rating. A service aspiring to be an excellent um, rated service is not only exceptional across several practice themes, as we talked about in Criteria 1, but it also embraces the responsibility of maintaining excellence and pursuing opportunities for further improvement. So the submission must show how the service intends to continue working over the next three years. And it, almost, it also must show how the service is committed to continuous improvement and sustaining that practice at the highest level. So, for example, in this part of the application or the submission, um, for example, you could detail some objectives with timelines for implementation and review. It could also describe how your service will build on existing excellent practice, share successes with the wider education and care sector, 
or act as a mentor to other services trying to achieve excellence. So, have we got you all inspired to apply? So who can apply? We mentioned previously that um, only approved providers of education and care services that have received an overall rating of exceeding national quality standard may apply to a CEQA for the award of the excellent rating. So it's important to note that the overall um, rating means that the service does not have, that does not need to be rated at exceeding across all of the seven quality areas. Remember we talked about the, um, you had to have four um, quality areas rated as exceeding and two, two of those had to be in the, the key areas. So there is a bit of a misconception out there that you need to be exceeding on all seven. Um, that's not the case. You need to have an overall rating of exceeding to apply. So in this example, the service has an overall rating of exceeding national quality standard because it is meeting national quality standard in quality areas two, three and four, but is actually exceeding national quality standard in um, quality areas one, five, six and seven. And of course, you can recognise that um, more than two of those are in the, the key areas. Section 152.4 of the National Law states that the application can be made only um, once every three years, unless a CEQA determines otherwise in a particular case. So what makes a good application? <clears throat> Again, um, section 152 of the National Law requires that an application must be in writing. It must include the, um, the prescribed information and it must include payment of the prescribed fee. As well as identifying the key elements that make the, set, the service outstanding or exemplary, the service, the application must also address all three of the criteria. When applying for the excellent rating, applica applicants will need to provide evidence to show how the service meets the criteria. So it's important to think about the many ways, the many different ways to present evidence as part of your submission. And Jennifer's going to talk a little bit more about that later in the, in, the, um, in the session. But it is important to think about the audience and what evidence you might use to support the claims or assertions um, that you make in your submission and how you might best present that information. Once again, and um, we keep reiterating, it is really important to make clear the links with outcomes for children and families. And now the assessment process. So the board, the ASEQA board has delegated its decision making power and there are two people in ASEQA who can award or not award the excellent rating. Our CEO, Karen Curtis, and the General Manager, Strategy and Operations, Georgia Ramsey, are the two people in a CEQA who currently have that delegation. So the first step is receiving the application, and a CEQA isn't able to, um, to process incomplete applications. So to ensure your application is complete, the approved provider needs to send the completed application form the required fee, the submission, and any supporting documentation or evidence. So once we've received the com completed um, application, a sequel will send an, e an email just confirming that receipt. And generally, an, an officer, an operations officer from a sequel will contact, will contact the um, applicant to discuss the process and also answer any questions that you might have in that process. So the next step is to seek advice from the regulatory authority. 
In carrying out the assessment, a CEQA must seek advice from the regulatory authority, from the state and territory, and the regulatory authority's advice might include or may include um, previous assessment and rating reports, information about the services compliance, and any other relevant information, including general comments about whether the service is of an exceptional standard. So then the application and the submission are reviewed. So a CEQA's officers will then review the information provided by the approved provider and also the um, information from the regulatory authority and using the criteria and the guidelines, they'll assess the application, the submission and the supporting documentation. So based on this assessment, a draft decision notice is developed. At this point, we need to also consider whether a, um, a site visit might be required. So in making a decision about whether um, a site visit is required, the legislation allows, um, gives a CEQA the power to, um, to make any inquiries it considers appropriate. And sometimes it will, it will be appropriate to make those inquiries in person by conducting a site visit. But site visits are not required for all applications. And they may re be reserved for applications where there is an element that requires further inquiry to assist in the decision-making process. So if I can give you some examples about when it might be appropriate to include a, a site visit, it could be where there are, are a number of applications received from a particular region or, um, or service and a site visit would distinguish between the services. The application may not have enough information and advisors need more facts and feel that there are some questions that can't be answered by um, that can't be answered effectively in writing or over the phone or through a Skype interview um, without misleading or um, leading the applicant. There may be times when advisors are, are unable to establish from the application and other available um, sources, such as the advice from the regulatory authority or the internet or research papers or other documents. Um, if we're not able to... Um, to establish the extent of the service's influence, it may be appropriate to do a site visit. So it would not generally be necessary to conduct a site visit if the applicant clearly meets the excellent rating criteria or if it does not meet um, the established criteria in the application and submission. Mm. Decisions about site visits are, are made on a case-by-case -case basis and we'll also um, try to be as creative as we can in terms of gathering evidence using things like Skype, um, Skype visits or other forms of evidence gathering. But it is really important to remember that a site visit is not a reassessment and the focus of the site visit will be on... Um, on seeking evidence to support the information that, that's included in the application and the submission. If a service visit is undertaken, information collected through this process will also be considered. The timing of the site visit has to fall within the um, legislated and agreed time frames to process the application. So to meet the time frames, ta the time frames it, it may be often the case that the, the site visit occurs quite quickly. So while we'll negotiate the, a suitable time for the visit, it's not necessary to do any spe special preparation for that visit. Because remember, the focus is on confirming the information that you've put in your submission and your application. So, then it's time to make the decision. So in a CEQA, we've been taking a very collaborative approach to the decision-making process, drawing on a range of perspectives, um, and then a decision notice is drafted. It's often a time-consuming process as information and guidelines are reviewed and considered, and there's a really strong commitment within the team um, to getting the decision right. 
So the decision notice is then considered by the approving officers before, it's been, before it is progressed to the decision makers. And remember the decision makers are Karen Curtis um, and uh, Georgia Ramsey. So a CEQA must make the decision on application within 60 days after the application has been received and they must give written notice of the decision um, on an application to the approved provider and the regulatory authority within 14 days of making the decision. It sounds like a long time, but believe me, those 60 days go very quickly um, when there's a lot of information to, um, to work through. So the period can be extended for up to 30 days if a CEQA requests um, further information. And in the case of an extension, that would impact on the, um, those legislative time frames. So we may or may not ask you to provide more information. Um, and if we receive any information that, um, that adversely affects your application during the inquiries, if, you have, if, you, if that's new information to you, we'll give you an opportunity to respond to that. And then it's time to notify you of the decision. So following the decision, a CEQA has 14 days to notify the approved provider of the decision. A CEQA must then publish notice of the award as soon as possible after the regulatory authority and the approved provider have been notified. And generally, this is the Wednesday after the service has been notified, as that's when um, a CEQA updates the information on the register. So if successful, the excellent rating is awarded for three years, for a period of three years, and it may be revoked if the service no longer meets the criteria for the excellent rating, or if the regulatory authority advises the CEQA that the overall rating level of the service is lower than exceeding the national quality standard. Oops, oops. So, recipients of the um, excellent rating will be presented with an award style certificate like the one um, on the screen. They'll also receive some basic marketing material to promote their service. They'll receive a branding package and guidelines to create their own marketing materials, such as banners and signage. And a CEQA will also help um, excellent services to share and demonstrate excellence with the sector. And the participation of our four um, excellent services today is a demonstration of that commitment. So the focus is on ensuring that excellence is embedded in practice and it will continue over time. So to sum up, some important things to remember in developing an application include a sequel will, is really going to be focusing on the quality of your service, not the quality of your application. So it's not necessary to engage an external consultant to put together your application. It really is the quality of the service that we're looking for. Remember, it's important that, um, that you address all three of the excellent rating criteria. And it's important to remember that you need to provide enough information and evidence for a CEQA to be able to assess your service against the criteria. So your application should reflect things that your service does that are exceptional. So remember the guidelines are a useful resource but they, and they provide some examples, but it's important to remember that they are only examples of what excellent practice might look like and please, please don't be limited by those examples. <clears throat> I think we've all agreed that the benchmark is high and it's unrealistic to expect that services would be excellent in all areas of service deliver delivery. So what a SEEK was looking for is services that have aspects of service delivery that are exceptional or outstanding, as well as that commitment to leadership and to continual quality improvement. So by its very nature, excellent practice may look and be different depending on the setting, the children, the location and the community. 
And I think that's one of the strengths of the National um, Quality Framework and the NQS, is that it does recognise um, you as professionals and recognise that, that you know your children, your families and your community, and that you um, can uh, identify and um, um, put your submission together in terms of where your service is outstanding or exceptional. So now I'm going to hand over to my colleague um, Jennifer, who's going to take us through the process of writing your own story of excellence. Thank you, Rhonda, and um, I hope everyone's feeling a little bit as though they have a little bit more information now, a little bit more knowledge about um, the process of applying for an excellent rating. I'm going to talk through some of the more practical aspects, um, and I also get the lovely job of speaking to our first four excellent rated services shortly. So um, that'll be a great opportunity to hear, um, hear from them what excellence looks like in practice. So as Rhonda mentioned, to apply for the excellent rating, providers need to complete the application form. That's pretty obvious. So you need to make sure that you complete the application form to demonstrate how you're meeting the criteria. And you can, you can find that application form and information about the excellent rating and the guidelines uh, for, the, for applying on the USEQA website. Um, before beginning your application, it might also be helpful for you to have a look at your assessment and rating report uh, and to draw on some of the information that was provided to you by your regulatory authority in your assessment and rating report. So to think about what it might have been that the authorised officer identified in terms of your strengths and those areas that led you uh, to receiving a rating of exceeding the national quality standard in your report. And to consider, I guess, the alignment between um, that and, and achieving that rating of exceeding the national quality standard and what particular features of your service then stand out in terms of excellent, excellence if you use that as a starting point. So are there areas of strength of your particular service that demonstrate outstanding practice that you could say that you've built on to uh, take those areas of practice to an outstanding level. So what kinds of evidence can you provide to a CEQA when um, you're applying for an excellent rating? Well, there are lots of different ways that you might choose to submit your evidence. So um, we've moved beyond, as we heard earlier today, our paper-based pen and paper applications. Uh, and you know there are lots of ways that you might provide evidence of excellence at your service. So that might include um, documents and reports. It might also include photographs and video footage. It might include audio. So there might be some audio that you could um, provide. You might provide information um, through video conferencing or Skyping or FaceTime or any of those kinds of um, technologies that I'm not all that familiar with, um, but some of you may be. So there are a number of different ways that you can provide that evidence. It is important to think about the audience and making that information as accessible as possible. So, for example, if you're considering um, audio or video presentations, you should think about providing key messages or summaries of key messages to accompany that audio or video presentation in writing so that there's some kind of key messages that you can support in writing that we can then look at in terms of assessing the application. Also, you need to think about the length of time if you're providing video footage or audio footage. So you need to think about the audience and accessibility. And sometimes people have a long story to tell, and that's great, but you need to consider that there's an audience that's, that's assessing that information. So making, it, um, making sure that you hit your points, making it concise, and providing you know, summaries in terms of um, outcomes, as Rhonda said earlier, um, the key being providing summaries around outcomes for children and families is really important. 
Also, there's a team of people at CEQA who are, who are looking at applications and assessing applications. So there'll be more than one person and more than one set of eyes that are looking at those applications. Okay. So as I said, it's really important to be explicit about outcomes for children and families. The guidelines acknowledge that being rated at exceeding the national quality standard tell us that your service has already gone beyond what's necessary to meet the national quality standard. So excellent practice is about is outstanding and makes a service stand out. It's about what makes your particular service stand out in terms of practice. And in part, that's because it's based on strong foundations. Excellence is about practical things, what you do, how you do it, and what it achieves, is importantly, what it achieves for children and families. It's also about understanding and using and contributing to holistic ways of working that help to promote and define good practice. An important objective of the National Partnership Agreement on the Quality Agenda for Early Childhood Education and Care that underpins the implementation of the National Quality Framework is to improve educational and developmental outcomes for children attending early education care services and outside school hour care services under the National Quality Agenda. So to be assessed as an excellent service, it's really important to be explicit in your application about outcomes for children and their families. So what are the benefits in terms of outstanding practice and what do they look like in terms of uh, outcomes for children and their families? This will also help you in identifying the areas in which your service is exemplary or stands out. Okay, now we've come to um, the part of the session that I've really been looking forward to, and that's an opportunity to talk to our services who have just very recently been rated um, as excellent services. So there's, there's um, lots of opportunity for us to hear now about what that looks like in practice. So could I invite, please, the representatives from Swallow Cliff Preschool, Penny Sweeney, from Wandana School-based preschool, Sue Shepherd, from Allenby Gardens Child Parent Centre, Judy Hunt, and from Karana Early Education Centre, Trisha Dean, up to the stage. And um, we're going to have an opportunity now to chat with them and talk a little bit more about their experiences. So, Penny, we might start with you. Yep. Yeah, that's your one. Okay. So, Penny, can you just start by telling us a little bit about yourself and what service you're from? So, I'm from Adelaide and I'm from Swallowcliffe Preschool, which is a school-based preschool. I've been working at the preschool for eight years and previous to that I was in the school for two years as a reception year one teacher and a literacy mentor. For the last two years in the preschool I've been coordinator um, and I work with two part-time teachers and four SSOs. We have one SSO who's on the floor with us continuously and the other three SSOs who are doing preschool support. Our preschool is situated on the school grounds next to the junior primary buildings and we have a capacity of 48, people per, uh, 48 children per session. We participate in as many school activities as we can, um, for example, school assemblies, using different rooms in the school, the computer room and library, visiting classes, having um, older children come as mentors for some of our children, PE fun days and any activities that we can be involved in. Penny, can you tell us a little bit more about the community that you work with and the unique features of your community? So Swallowcliffe is located in Davron Park, which is in Elizabeth in South Australia. The school-based site is classed by the department as a Category 1 in the Index of Disadvantage. The student population is characterised by high levels of disadvantage due to poverty, high transient population with at least 80% of our uh, students qualifying for school card. Children who attend our service range from birth to five years old and we cater for these children with playgroup, early entry, pre-entry, extended terms, preschool transition and community groups and events. Okay. 
So I understand that a strength of your service is the way that you connect with your families and the community and support them in their role as parents. So can you tell us about some of the programs that you've implemented at Swallowcliff to do that? Yeah, so I'll just give a few examples. Um, we uh, film a lot of the children and take lots of photos. So when parents come in, we have a computer screen running with um, the videos going continually of the children. We also have a digital frame um, f that has photos running continually of different things that have happened and we change and add them continually um, throughout the week. Um, the school principal grants small and, uh, and the staff are involved with a group that is helping to reclaim our area in Davron Park, focusing on cleaning up streets and tidying up streets and houses around the school. We have an SSO who has a title of a community liaison worker and her focus is connecting with families. She does things um, with phone calls, ringing for att attendance or good news calls, sends out postcards to families who we can't get in contact with by phone, home visits, attends appointments with families who aren't confident in doing so, um, participates in all the community events that we have runs the play group, um, supports other um, things such as dad's groups that other Smith family and Angley Care also come in and support us with, um, and gives in-depth enrolment meetings um, to the families as they begin. We also have twilight nights, which run once a term, starting from five o'clock. Um, we've been offering a shared meal or a snack at each session, um, and we just learnt to be really consistent. We started off with very low numbers, but um, our numbers each time we had it increased. We have an end of year celebration um, at the park with families attending with their children and have a whole range of different activities for them to be involved in. Uh, we do ring and have good news calls once a week um, and if we can't contact those families we send out the postcards and that's just a real um, positive in lots of parents are expecting um, and maybe a negative reason for us to be ringing, but um, the good news calls have had many parents in tears because they've been so happy with receiving good news. Uh, we have family meetings once a term and um, we try and get different speakers at these, for example speech pathologists or whatever the parents' needs are at that time. We have afternoon teas once a term for families to attend and look in the children's learning journals. Um, and all families attend at some stage during that afternoon. The dads group we have um, is supported by the Smith family and also our community liaison worker. We have interviews for families twice a year. We have a graduation at the end of each term, which we use um, at the school assembly. We um, participate in the school assembly and grant at the school principal presenters, presents the children with certificates. Um, grant also meets with families before the assembly to talk to them about the school needs. We have transition um, and we get the parents involved with transition as much as we can. Uh, it may differ each term depending on the needs of the children. We also regularly visit the Aboriginal Elders Village, which is across the road, and access health programs um, like the Smith Family in Anglicare that is available in our area. Uh, we have families that are part of the School Governing Council. Uh, we also have a roster to make sure that there are staff at the um, beginning and the end of each session uh, to welcome um, families. So there's lots of of diverse programs that are running to support your community in terms of the work that you're doing. And in developing and implementing these programs, what changes have you seen in practice and what positive outcomes have you seen for children and families? So I'm just gonna give you um, a quick overview of um, say one child's life in our preschool and I'm just gonna call him John. He first attended playgroup when he came with his foster mum at two years of age. He couldn't walk, speak or sit up due to family issues that had happened when he was in the first two years of his life. He attended playgroup each week and as teachers we make an effort to get into playgroup to meet the parents and meet the children uh, each week. We then saw as he started preschool amazing growth and this year he left us to go to school. He was walking, talking in sentences, running, eating, counting, recognising letters and um, I could go on. His foster mum was involved in every opportunity she could in the preschool. She came to all our twilight nights with grandparents, she attended family meetings and when she couldn't come to the afternoon tea she would send along her husband. She cried when she got a good news call and she hung her first, his first painting up on her fridge for the whole year. She attended meetings each term at the preschool where we organised all the agencies involved to participate and she was actively involved in writing up his individual learning plan with us and would support us by supporting his learning at home. 
If she had any concerns, she would come to any staff member or she would also use emailing. I still receive emails from her updating the staff with what John is doing at school and we proudly have a photo of John up in the preschool in his school uniform. So the main change we've seen is the strong development of relationships with our community. The early years learning framework supports the need for strong relationships with both families and children. Consistent staff at our site supports the relationship, strengthening over time as we have many families who do not have a successful time at school and didn't have that trust with educators. Developing those relationships has allowed the families to trust us with their children and their learning. And it has also given them the opportunity to learn to interact with their children at different times and given them family for their own needs. Many families come to the community liaison worker just to talk about different things happening at home, such as toileting issues or behaviour issues. And the National Quality Framework identified the need for our centre to make this a focus when we first started to look at the framework. As a team, we're proud of what we've achieved as strong relationships can be the key to any child's education. So a quick question to end with because I think we're probably running close to the bone in terms of time. There's lots of work that you've been doing. What sorts of things are you thinking of in terms of um, continuous improvement and how to keep that momentum going? Sure. Um, I think I'll just skip because I know I'll probably take, I'll go to my last two points, sorry. Um, there's two real main ones. Uh, I was lucky enough to get a coordinator's role in a preschool. That doesn't usually happen because um, we're on site, um, on a school site. Um, so that's been a really important aspect because it's given me time to do admin but as well be there for the families and have lots of um, communication with the families. The second thing that's been really important is a really supportive school principal. Um, that ensures um, that I have that time, that ensures things work smoothly within the school and the junior primary. Um, and it's just been really vital to be able to have that positive relationship with the school um, and to support those parents as they move on and the families as they move on to, to the school. Thanks, Penny. Thanks for the work that you're doing. Can I just ask Sue Shepherd from Wandana School Based Preschool to come forward, please? Now, Sue, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the service that you're from? Uh, yes, I'm Sue, obviously. Um, I'm also in a school based preschool, as is Penny, um, which means that we don't have a um, designated leader within the preschool. Um, there's two teachers, Daniela is here with me also. And we share the teaching load and we also share all of the admin load. I guess um, I have seniority only by the fact that I've been there longer and I'm older. <laughs> um, Daniela is a, a quite a new teacher, but she has been a long time in our centre because she was our bilingual worker before she was our teacher. So we're very proud of her progress. Um, I've been teaching for 30 years and all of that time I've been teaching in disadvantaged and highly complex settings uh, which has stood me in good stead for the challenges that I've faced in the last 10 years at this site. Our team uh, is the two teachers. We have a full-time SSO. I'm not sure what they're called in other states but SSO is a school services officer so they're a teacher's assistant sort of. Uh, and uh, part-time SSO and we also have several preschool um, support workers for children with special needs and uh, bilingual workers for our community. So tell us a little bit more about your community and the unique features of the community. Well, uh, I've been at the school for 13 years and when I first came there our school was very much like uh, what Penny described. School-based preschools in South Australia were all um, initially started in schools of high level of complexity. Uh, to address those needs and give children a good start. Um, so at that time there were significant levels of poverty, trauma and a, a high degree of transience because it was a rental area and people came and went uh, very often. Since then it's become a bit more established because there's been uh, new housing developments uh, uh, built all around the preschool and uh, still in the process of being developed and only one in four of those are housing trust housing so we've got a lot more established families now we still have some transients but nothing like what we used to get but a lot of those families that have come into the area are from a very multicultural um, background so excuse me i'll just take them off 
Uh, we have a capacity of 80 students. We normally would run at about 65, but this year because um, we're losing students but not getting any because we're starting the same start date next year, um, we have 30 students at the moment. 25 of those are from EALD, English as an additional and uh, language and dialect background. And uh, within that 25, there's 17 different language groups, so they can't talk to each other and they can't really talk to us either. Uh, two are new arrivals with absolutely no English whatsoever. And within all of that, there are Muslims, Sikhs, Hindus, Christians, both Catholic and Orthodox, and Buddhists. <laughs> we have three Aboriginal students as well, one who's uh, three years of age and another enrolment starting next term who's three years of age, and uh, four children recognised as having additional needs, uh, including speech and language, uh, one child with autism and another with selective mutism. So it's a very, very complex group. Apart from that, we <clears throat> have 25 early entry students who started this term, and they are all uh, from non-English speaking background because that qualifies them, except for one. He's a white Australian child and he has significant speech and language difficulties, so we can't understand him either. <laughs> so a very complex community Incredibly. and a very diverse um, community. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little about some of your strengths of the work that you do is around cultural inclusion and Aboriginal inclusion. Um, you've also extended those practices into the broader school community. So mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit more about how you've done that in this area of your work? Okay. I'll try and do it briefly, sorry. Um, well, our focus is always on the similarities that unite us um, and the variety of ways that people connect with community and family, but the parts of that that join us together. And a lot of that is about celebration um, because we all love to celebrate. So we invite all families uh, from all backgrounds to share a special celebration with us. We work in consultation with them to do a presentation. Um, with the children involving some kind of uh, tradition in Diwali, it's making a candle and getting um, a tikka or a bindi on their head. Uh, we celebrate with all the Muslim families by having an Eid party and asking them to tell us a little bit about how they would celebrate it in their particular country of origin. Um, we celebrate Chinese New Year and uh, also we celebrate Christmas and Easter with all of those diverse families and they're quite comfortable in doing that because they know we recognise and respect their special celebrations as well, so uh, we do a lot of celebrating <laughs> and we eat great food. <laughs> um, we've also had some other things that are particular to um, families at the time, like Vietnamese um, Moon Festival and so on. Uh, uh, we also have practices throughout the year that uh, reflect and respect those cultural traditions. For instance, having halal meat, if we were having cooking, we make sure that everyone is able to eat that. We're also aware that the Hindi families don't eat beef, so that restricts what halal food you can have. Um, we went to visit the farm last week and we had to make sure that the pigs didn't come out of their sty because the Muslim children are not allowed to be exposed to pigs. Um, when we're organising events, we try and avoid Ramadan because that, that's very difficult for families when they uh, have to eat at sunset. So uh, it's really influenced the way that we think and plan with our families. Um, with Aboriginal culture, we consult with all of the Aboriginal families that come into the centre. Some choose to be more involved than others. Um, but two of those uh, people who were parents in the centre stayed on as volunteers after their children went to school and are now staff members with us. Uh, another lady was a foster parent of a child who came through our centre. We got her very involved. We uh, do a, a quite a strong focus every year around the time of Sorry Day and uh, NAIDOC Week on Aboriginal culture because we believe that every Australian child deserves to be knowledgeable about the uh, indigenous heritage of this country. So uh, we invited this uh, foster mother to come and she has become the resident elder in the centre. She feels very comfortable with us and still comes back to visit every day. Um, comes in for a cup of tea every afternoon and a look-see in the morning to see who's there and say hello. And so she gets lots of hellos in lots of languages. Um, she has now gone on to uh, be part of our governing council. She's also uh, now running the breakfast program in the school and the Nunga Pride group for the other Aboriginal parents. She helps with um, homework centre 
and it has raised the profile and the possibilities throughout the school of how to be inclusive of families of different backgrounds. We work very closely with the ESL teacher uh, and she's now starting to bring a lot of those practices through uh, into the assemblies and in the classrooms in the school. Thank you, Sue, and I think we probably need to move on. But no, 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 that's fine. Thank you so much, right. and thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you. Uh, can I just invite Judy Hunt from Allenby Gardens Child Parent Centre? Thanks, Judy. Do you want to just start by telling us a bit about yourself and your community? Sure. Even though we're labelled a child parent centre, we're a school-based preschool the same as the other two sites. There are some historical and traditional things that mean we have slightly different names for those places at the moment. And we offer um, 15 hours of government funded preschool to, to, well, to four year olds, but that's slightly changing with our change in staff date. Our capacity is similar, 44. Um, at a session, we're working with up to 75 families. Our staff team is um, two teachers and two support staff as the main staff. We have some extra support staff for additional needs children. And I have the role of a coordinator, which, as Penny has said, is not the usual in these sites. But we have principals who are our nominated supervisors who have put additional funding in to create a leadership position in our, in our preschools. So can you tell us a little bit about the strengths of the work that you're doing, particularly around leadership with the Early Years Learning Framework and the National Quality Standard and what's, what that's looked like in practice for you? Well, early on we had a change in team, so there were some new people involved. And we felt strongly that all educators had leadership capacity and how could we best foster that? And the NQS actually came at a really good time for us because it, the review kit gave us an excellent tool to use for review and reflection on our practice. Our provider also has some review tools that are available for us to use. So we began with everybody um, taking that as a training opportunity to do a full review in each of the quality areas of what we thought we were able to demonstrate, not just what we thought was good, but what evidence we would have, and to identify some particular things that we needed to do. So we were then, once we had people looking in that more positive light, our support staff used unpaid time, which was very generous of them, but we began some focused and systematic discussions around what we needed to do. And a lot of that involved talking about the children and our relationships and work with them. So we found the meetings were becoming easier and easier. And people were taking on leadership roles within their capacity and their knowledge. So that became um, an excellent tool for us to do that. Our next port of call was the, the um, Early Years Learning Framework, where we were jotting down outcomes and talking about children's learning in that respect. But as a team hadn't looked at the practices and principles of that document as thoroughly as we could have been, we were sort of doing it on our own, but going off on our own tangent. And there's a document um, that was developed in South Australia, Reflect, Respect, Relate, which is a research tool. And it's a research tool that looks holistically at children's learning and the practices of educators. So that supported that beginning part of the ELF, um, EYLF, very, very nicely. And we were able to begin with looking at, um, in that document, which is the involvement scale, and that relates directly to children's agency and their and deep, high-level engagement in activities. And because it was looking at the children rather than us, it was a perfect place to start. So we were able to have some very specific goals and some very specific actions that we wanted to follow up from that. And the team were really keen to then go on to the educator roles and film ourselves. Um, I did say I was featuring a lot and I didn't think that was fair. Um, but we'd managed to develop that trust and the common dialogue to be able to do that together. So I think um, that team and having a purpose and recognising everybody's abilities has meant that we've um, 
being able to provide those training opportunities and develop our practice. Mm -hmm. So just to finish off, what has been the impact, what's been the noticeable impact for you and the service in the, in the work that you've been doing around that? When that was mentioned before and one of the things that we did in our application was talk about some particular stories to show examples and there is a, a family at our centre, um, many with diverse needs and additional needs, but a family with a highly anxious little boy and a highly, highly anxious mother who had previously not experienced particularly positive relationships um, some years ago with older siblings and their own schooling experiences probably hadn't been particularly positive either. But because we had developed that notion of what relationships looked like in our centre and what learning looked like, we then had common understandings and some consistent practice with all of our staff. And the evidence of that non-judgmental environment and supporting the families with their goals and aspirations <coughs> has meant that we now have a little boy who, going from being um, having selective mutism to still being fairly quiet, but we don't have the tears and the trauma and the anxiety. And on his school transition visits, we've had to ask him to settle down. <laughs> and at one stage, we didn't think he would even make it that far. And then on um, Wednesday morning, we had visitors, because that was the announcement of our excellent. And I was watching very, very carefully. But mum left quite early, so she was feeling comfortable. Now, you'd think that... So for the, her, that was a positive, that she was leaving. The place was full of adults. And um, the little lad was smiling and still talking to his friends. He hadn't retreated back. So it was a very tangible um, example of us having that culture in the centre of um, working and, and helping that family. Sounds like he's come a long way. He's come a long way. <laughs> but we've seen lots of... We also do a quite structured parent survey um, annually and we've had a huge increase in the percentage of satisfaction with program, with relationships and with staff leadership has been evident in that survey. And access is up to 15 hours and we now have most of our families coming for 15 hours. It's been good. Great. Thanks very much, Judy. Thank you. And could I just invite uh, Tricia Dean from Karana Early Education Centre to join me. So Tricia, can you just start by telling us a little bit about um, yourself and your service and the community? Yep. So my name is Tricia, if you can't read. <laughs> um, I'm the director at Karana Early Education Centre. Um, I work with a team of 14 incredible educators who I wish were all here to share this with us over these next couple of days. Um, it's been very hard being away from them <laughs> at this time. But um, I guess we, uh, we're a very strong team and, and all of the processes at our service are very collaborative within our team. Um, our community is at Karana Downs, which is on the western outskirts of Brisbane, and it's um, I guess the best way for me to describe it is even though it's a suburb of Brisbane, is like a little country town. So it's very, very close-knit community. The families are all um, very networking with each other all of the time and, um, and meet with each other and, and get along. So, yeah. so some of the strengths of your service are around children's agency and programming and curriculum that empowers children to make choices and direct their own learning. So can you tell us a little bit more about what that looks like in practice and how that's grown and developed at, at Karana? Yep. Um, I guess, similar to what has been discussed, one of the big things um, for us in our service is um, children's agency and autonomy and, and at the forefront of everything that we do every day is the children. So um, practices that we have spent a lot of time reflecting on and working on are things around uninterrupted play into, um, routines for children and how we go about doing that. So some of the things that we've implemented as part of that are children being able to have access to indoor and outdoor for the majority of the day at all times, um, 
choosing when they rest and sleep and where they rest and sleep, choosing their own meal times and, and making all of those routines, um, I guess as flexible and diverse as each individual child is within our service so that they can have um, their own say in what they're doing. Um, and I guess the big thing is also respecting, respecting the children and giving them um, the scope and the space to live and learn within our community. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little, oh, I'm just going off the script yeah. now, tell us a little bit about your fairy garden and how your fairy garden came to okay. be. Okay, um, we have a fairy garden which is still a work in progress. So um, probably earlier last year or towards the end, no, probably about mid last year, the children um, within our preschool group were quite involved within their room environment in building a fairy garden and designed things, drew pictures, had... Um, a corner of the room which they created into a fairy garden. When we started really looking at the scope of um, the indoor and the outdoor environments, we decided to collaborate a little bit with the children and talk with them about what a fairy garden might look like outside. And so the children have had, um, I guess, a lot of say in the planning and it's still a very evolving area, but we um, had unfortunately a big tree which had to get cut down, but we were able to keep the roots <laughs> and big root systems of the big fig tree. So um, that is, I guess, formed the, the basis of our fairy garden. And when we talked with the children, so we've built an arch which we're growing jasmine over and We've had families donate some little butterflies to hang up in the area and, and little fairies that sit through. So I guess it's just about the children also helping to create the environment that they're playing in so that they have a say in what's important to them. So there's a real sense of children um, having ownership over their space. Yeah, definitely. Um, how do you plan to sustain that into the future? What sorts of um, systems do you have in terms of planning or thinking about future planning? Um, I guess all the time, so I, in a way it's just continuing what we're doing and, and looking at the children as they're coming through and obviously children move through and they move on from us so I think it's about us constantly not stopping where we are but looking at where children are changing and moving to and what their interests now become and um, evolving and changing our environments to reflect the children that are there at that point in time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tisha. And thank you to all of our representatives from our services. Thank you. There's a great diversity of strengths represented in these four services, and they have strengths in no a number of different areas. So uh, that's been really interesting. And we are really pressed for time now. So if the members of our panel can quickly run, run up to the stage. <laughs> So um, I'd like to introduce Linda Matthews from the South Australian Department for Education and Child Development, Acting Director Early Learning and Quality Reform, Sharon Neen, who's the approved provider for Karana Early Education Centre, SK Kids Queensland, Rhonda Livingston, who's a CEQA's Senior Advisor, Excellent Rating, Chris Mason, who's a Senior Manager Operations for a CEQA, and Megan Alston, who's Manager Operations for a CEQA. Um, so we've got probably seven minutes now um, to throw open to the floor. So if there's anybody who has any questions, um, now's the time. Just one down the front here. Thanks, Kat. <coughs> Um, is it Sharon Neen? Are you the approved provider for Karana? Is that yes. is that right? Yes. Um, I'd just be interested to know: is that the only service that you're the approved provider for, or do you have a number of services? Or we have um, three services. So um, we have had the Karana Early Education Centre for three years, and in December last year we opened up two brand new services from scratch: um, one in Springfield, which is sort of the Ipswich area. Mm -hmm and one in Kapalaba, which is more sort of the Redland Bayside area. Uh -huh. And are they long daycare? What sort of they capacity are long daycare do you have? They are long daycare as well. So um, Springfield is a 67 capacity, um, Karana obviously is a 63, uh -huh. and Kapalaba is a 74. Uh -huh. And do so. you have layers of management between yourself and the directors? Absolutely. Yes. So each um, centre has its own director, yep. and then um, myself and my husband Scott, who's actually the actual licensee, <laughs> um, we visit the services each week. Uh -huh. um, 
I usually try and spend at least half a day at each service a week. Sometimes mm -hmm. it becomes a full day mm -hmm. and um, Scott tends to pop in, I don't know, if, if things need fixed or if the phones are down or if the computers are down. Yeah. <laughs> so we try to be sort of what it, whatever they need us to be, we try to be that. So. so you don't have any other managers between yourself? Okay, that, no, that's, just, that's good. Yeah, yes. it's very, um, at this stage, it's, they're our babies, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> yep, okay, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? <coughs> no, there's a question that's come through on the Gizmo app, I think that's what it's called. So I might direct that question to Chris, who's our um, Senior Manager of Operations. So Chris, the question is the, around the fee for the excellent application process and why there's a fee. And uh, a bit of a tricky one around um, a CEQA would want to encourage all centres to strive for excellence and I think that the rationale behind that is so then why is there a fee? Thanks for that question, whoever asked that question. Um, <laughs> So the short answer about the fee, the fee varies depending on the size of the service. So the fee is either $204 for a small size service, 408 or 612 so they're kind of broken into small, medium and large. Uh, the fee is mandated by the national law, so it's handed down to us. This is the fee that we have been given to work with. Uh, the excellent rating isn't mandatory. It's at the uh, provider's discretion. You know, there is a prerequisite to be exceeding national quality standard overall allows you to um, apply, you don't have to apply. Um, clearly we would like to encourage people to apply. We, we can see benefit for everyone involved in that process. Um, this is a question that does come up quite a lot. You know, it is additional work for you, there is, is additional money attached. It's not money that we have the flexibility to change or alter. This is what is down in the, in the statute. Just another question down the front. had nine so far. Okay. And have you ever applied what do you think you're going to let her? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we like to call it a decision. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't just say no. Um, so we'll always try to look at all three criteria and pick up the strengths as well as the, weak as well as the weaknesses. So clearly we want to feedback where people have met each individual criteria but also make the key points where we feel we haven't seen demonstrated excellence in certain areas uh, and hopefully then in the future we'll get reapplications from services who've gone back, thought about the, those areas and, and reapplied to us. And what's the time frame then? How long can they reapply? Well technically then they can't reapply for all three years but we have the discretion to look at that on a case by case basis. And some of the services that um, haven't achieved the excellent rating overall have been found to be excellent in certain areas. So, you know, they might have met some of the themes in Criterion 1, but maybe not the, li the leadership criteria, which is a little bit different to leadership under the NQS. It sort of expects um, like a wider reaching leadership um, that develops a community or a local area. So that's something that they're hopefully going to look at, um, sharing that practice that is within the service at that highest level. I mean, every, every assessment rating visit is an individual process. I think the assessment goes. Not like no. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, I'm a, I work for a local government provider and we have a lot of services and four of those have already um, received an exceeding um, rating and we've got another one about to go through and we're expecting an exceeding rating hopefully. Um, Rhonda mentioned in her presentation about um, looking at the area um, that, that a, a service of excellence would be rated um, or appointed. We've got 17 centres. What happens if all those 17 centres are exceeding and there's you know, probably 30 private services? Is there only going to be one 
Oh, no, no, no. Appointment? No. Because no. one of the criteria that she discussed was about looking at what's happening in the area. I think it was in relation to um, the decisions about whether a site visit would be involved. And in the case of um, okay. the services that have been rated as excellent, there was a cluster, so it made sense to go and visit those services to gather some information that supported the application. Okay. Yeah, I was just thinking we've got some services that have got exceeding in every area. So I'm thinking applying for like three of those four as yeah, a centre of excellence, and I'm thinking maybe I should just pick the best one. No, 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 because the main thing is if a service meets the criteria, Spend then my money. they can be <laughs> awarded the excellent rating. There's no, there's no sort of limit. I was thinking about I'm not going to waste my budget on sending in applications over $1,000. There's no limit per I'm only going to get one of those. Like that, no <laughs> and you. it is really about um, being empowered to identify what it is in those services that's outstanding or exceptional. And you know there might be some of the, those 17 services. Was it 17? Yeah, they're not they're not all exceeding um, <laughs> at this stage. Um, but four that we uh, have done, we've just you know one of them we're about to submit the application, and two others we're very close. So obviously today's presentation has helped that. But I was thinking you know <laughs> if it was only going to be one, I would pick the one that I thought was and going Lorraine's to definitely. And Lorraine's probably in a good um, position. Oh, sorry, Linda. Linda's in a good position to talk about the process that you went through in terms of supporting your services? So we have um, approximately 400 preschools and of those about a quarter are school-based preschools <coughs> and about 12, there's 12 family daycare uh, systems with about 700 educators. So it's fairly large um, and what we did was look through the reports that we had and we added the criteria that for us the services that wanted to apply needed to be exceeding in leadership because if leadership wasn't there we believe that the service wouldn't be leaderful and that was something that we wanted so we sort of selected yeah. out of those and invited some people to come to a discussion and this is what they did <laughs> <laughs> uh, very seriously that's what they did um, they really weren't that interested um, because it was. They figured it might be a whole lot of work, yeah. and they'd gone through the assessment process and were reluctant. We didn't write anybody's application. We talked with them, but they did their own applications, and we paid and sent them off. We're in a very similar situation. Yeah, very similar. But we're just looking at. We've got family daycare as well, but yeah. um, more focused on, at the moment, the centre-based stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Just a question that's come through on the show Gizmo app. Um, really a question and a comment in one, saying that only one of the services that achieved an excellent rating is a long daycare centre and the other three are preschools. So just thoughts from the panel in regard to that and perhaps some rationale behind that. Chris or Megan? Yeah. I, mean, I think the short answer is it's very early days. So there are over, so probably we've had about over 3,000 services are now rated. About a quarter of those are exceeding the National Quality Standard overall. So you're looking at around 750 eligible services. We've only had nine applications so far. There was a batch that came from South Australia. So the fact we've only got four uh, services now rated excellent, three of which are from South Australia and three of which are preschools, it's not surprising given that there was that batch application early on in the process. Maybe just take two. I'm just conscious that we are a little bit over time, so um, we'll take two more questions. Um, is there a time frame in which you have to apply for the excellent rating after you've received exceeding? No, there's not. So the, the only so requirement is out. that you are achieving exceeding. So yes. as long as you have that rating, you can apply. So there's no, like if six months later you yeah. decide, yeah. you still can. Yeah, you can. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm um, a preschool field officer from Wyndham City Council in Melbourne. Um, so it's probably a bit similar to the SOS role in the school site that they were talking about earlier. But I just wanted to mention um, for us who are going out and supporting the educators with kids with additional needs, we've found that um, this has this whole 
ELF and um, NQS hasn't really been placed into the early intervention part or for us. So we've kind of had to take a run and um, implement our own um, part of this, which has been fun, um, to incorporate that back into um, our work with the educators and the families. I'm just wondering, have you thought about that? <laughs> Is that one for Rhonda? Well, I guess, um, I, I think I said it before, I think one of the strengths of the um, National Quality Framework and the standard in particular is that it does acknowledge that, um, that your professionals, you know your children, your families, your communities really well. And in terms of developing up a submission around um, the, uh, how your service is excellent, it, it does empower you. Yes, there is criteria because clearly ed the ed um, quality of the education and care is really important, as is the leadership and the, um, the focus on continual improvement. But it empowers you to tell us what wonderful things you're doing in your community with your children and your families. And I think we saw that today in terms of the diversity across the four services. And, um, and I think um, I made the point that there's not an expectation that you're excellent across all service, all the areas of your service delivery. That's an unrealistic expectation. But it sounds like that you're doing some wonderful things in your service and, and it is about um, pulling that together in a submission and telling the story um, in terms of those criteria. Yeah, yeah we have developed a, a quip we're in the process of, of our own, but I know that when this initially um, commenced and the training was all starting, we were asking questions then they couldn't really answer it, so I'm just wondering, it's still kind of sitting there. And it is, you know, um, when we started off on this journey way back in 2008, it was about um, being inspirational and um, setting aspirational standards. So there's a recognition that it will take services some time to reach that, cert, that standard, but it is about that focus on continual improvement and being reflective practitioners. You know, just the, um, the fact that you are growing and learning from those experiences um, shows that you are a, re a reflective practitioner. And for me, having a look at some of the services and the, the service providers who talk today about working in low, low socioeconomic and disadvantaged communities, that was inspiring to me because it means that what we're, we're measuring, what we, we're trying to measure, and that's not the most beautiful environment or the, the, um, you know, the, the best resourced service. It's the service that focuses on the quality of interactions and is doing really good things with their children, their families, and the community in which they work. Thanks very much. And I think we're going to have to wrap it up there. We are running out of time, or we've run out of time. Can you just join me in thanking the panel? And I might just add that probably the panel will be sticking around for a little while afterwards, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. So if you had burning questions, come and ask us. Okay, can I just say quietly now, thank you very much to everybody and thank you to our panel. I hope many of you in the room now have the knowledge and inspiration to begin writing that story of excellence. That's the end of day one. For those of us that are joining us for dinner, we'll see you at the Parkside Ballroom at 7pm. I hope you've all had a wonderful day and have a wonderful day tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah.